On behalf of Ambassador Phillips, I would like to welcome you all today again. Unfortunately, Ambassador Phillips was delayed in returning from Washington. He's feeling a little bit under the weather, um, but is very, very sorry he can't be with you here in person today. But we do have the good fortune to have a direct connection with him in Washington, so we'll have a few words from him. Uh, and Mr. Ambassador, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I'm here and ready to go. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, um, I have more than a few words. Uh, I'm going to give the speech that I was going to give there uh, this morning's conference. Um, that I'm sorry I can't be there. I'm not able to travel for several days. Um, so I, uh, I will miss the interaction with everybody. But as I typically say here, welcome to the new Villa Tavern Theater. But I'm welcoming you from my private residence in DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C., and I hope everything is going uh, very well for you. And I do want to take probably some time here to give you the background and context of how this conference uh, came about, uh, and more specifically, our, the American experience. You're going to hear from some great uh, experts following uh, me today about our experience. Uh, but before I do that, I want to briefly comment about how spectacular the state dinner was for Italy and for Prime Minister Renzi. It was, as the president said, we saved the last, the best for the last. This is the last of all the state dinners. There only have been 13. And it was an extraordinary success. Uh, I was there for a day and a half, spent an enormous amount of time with uh, the Prime Minister and his wife and President Obama, uh, Vice President Biden, Secretary of State Kerry, uh, and many others. And I just, uh, in meetings in the Oval Office, but also the public uh, events. It was a beautiful day, um, a real uh, 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 special presentation that we do in America to honor uh, countries with with whom we have such a close relationship with. You should be very proud of your prime minister. Uh, he was extraordinarily uh, well received. Um, speeches that he gave uh, throughout were interesting, insightful, uh, and charming. Uh, we had a meeting in the Oval Office. We had a press conference in which both President Obama and, Vice, and Prime Minister Renzi spoke at. Uh, very eloquently and, and very effectively. And the state dinner uh, uh, on Tuesday night was unbelievably elegant in a huge tent outside of the White House grounds. So all in all, it really confirmed the relationships between our countries are so strong, and particularly the relationship between President Obama and Prime Minister Renzi is very strong. You know, I introduced the President to Prime Minister Renzi when he first became Prime Minister. And I remember saying, look, I know you liked Enrico Letta a lot, but uh, this new Prime Minister is very different. He is full of energy. He speaks rapidly. He moves uh, quickly. He's so uh, supportive of America. He, he modeled his campaign and his party after uh, Yes, We Can. And he is so supportive and interested in uh, uh, Barack, you, Barack Obama. So he's going to be very excited to meet you, uh, and you'll get to know him over time. Well, he was exactly that, very excited to meet him. But here it is two and a half years later, and the president has made it clear he is so impressed with the leadership that Prime Minister Renzi has shown in the context of the EU community, all the meetings around the world, G7, the G20. He has seen him emerge as someone focusing on the right issues, pushing the right issues, uh, not afraid to take on controversial points regarding the EU. He's also seen the tremendous reform efforts that he is making at home in Italy, which he made clear uh, he thinks is very important uh, for Italy to pursue to be part of that global community. So all in all, it was a great success and made both of our countries uh, very proud, proud of our relationships and proud of our president and, uh, and the prime minister. So. Let me move on to the, the main event, this conference, and how it came about. When I first arrived 
uh, in Italy as ambassador over three years ago now. Uh, they circulate information about the background of the new ambassador, what he's done. And, and my background was as public interest lawyer, civil rights work, environmental work. But most specifically, they read, I did a lot of work in, um, in fraud and corruption uh, that was uh, very significant, sort of transforming how America approaches that. And when I would meet with ministers, from the very beginning, they would say, we're very interested in what you were able to work with in the American system to get accomplished there. Do you think that approach may work here in Italy? If so, would like very much to see if it can be pursued here. My response always was, well, yes, if you have the will, I think there's no reason that why it couldn't be applicable uh, to Italy just as it was in the United States with all the resistance that you can expect to find when you try to do uh, something new. So over the years in talking to numerous people, including many in government, we said, let's have a conference at some point to bring together the American experience, those experts who can speak very directly about the success of this uh, approach and dealing with corruption and, and fraud. So that's what brings us uh, here today. And it's for our opportunity to tell you about our American experience in this area. It's for you to ask questions to see whether you think uh, this would work for you and whether uh, there are ways in which we can work uh, together. Uh, let me give you the brief story, and I'll try to keep this uh, somewhat brief, so only I can personally tell this story. That's why it's important for me to be able to speak to you. Um, my career, as I mentioned, was a, was a public interest lawyer in Los Angeles uh, doing uh, big, big case environment work, civil rights work, but we were one of the very first Ford Foundation funded public interest lawyers, meaning that our fees were paid by foundations and it was not our clients. So it was always a problem of where we're going to get continued funding. Uh, in doing research, I came across this old law on the books many years. In fact, it was passed by Abraham Lincoln called the Lincoln Law. That had some stunning aspects to it. Uh, but the law had been completely dormant. No one really knew about it. Uh, it, it enabled individuals with knowledge a fraud against the government to initiate a lawsuit on behalf of the government against those responsible and, if successful, to share in a percentage of the recovery. Those are the two unique features of that law that struck me as really, really significant. And if we could make this law modernized today for contemporary jurisprudence, it could have an enormous impact because it had been completely dormant for reasons I uh, won't spend time on here. So I, uh, because fraud against the American government was a big issue, because so little money was being recovered after spending hundreds of billions of dollars, the average recovery per year was like $25 million. Uh, I thought this presented an opportunity. So I spent about a year developing amendments and doing it extensive research as to how this law can be modernized uh, and made applicable to today's jurisprudence. And when completed, I took them back to Congress and I went first to a very Republican, conservative Republican, Chuck Grassley from Iowa, who was the most outspoken critic about fraud against the government and said, here's something you could do. Take a look at this approach. It's very different and I think it could work. Uh, he did and he embraced it. Uh, as his own. And then I went to a good friend of mine, uh, Congressman Howard Berman, the liberal Democrat from Los Angeles on the Judiciary Committee. They didn't know each other, but I introduced them and they formed that partnership. This was back in 1985 to say, let's do this together from both sides of the political aisle, <clears throat> from both sides of the political spectrum. And they uh, worked together introducing that bill I won't get into the legislative details, but it took almost two years uh, with hearings uh, about what the law would do, how it would change. And we said, look, everybody's against fraud against the government. <clears throat> this will help strengthen the hand of the government. This will incentivize all citizens who know about fraud to come forward. The theory was, look, we're only getting maybe 10 percent 
of the fraud that's being committed against the government. It's like an iceberg. 90% of it is undiscovered, unknown. And the way you get it brought to the surface is you create incentives for the people who have knowledge about the fraud, maybe even sometimes forced to participate as an employee. Uh, that was the concept. <clears throat> and uh, we got it passed. And Ronald Reagan signed this bill on October 27th, 2000. Uh, excuse me, 1986, it'll be 30 years next week that this bill was enacted uh, as a bipartisan effort. Now, nobody knew it would make a difference. It wasn't a high-profile piece of legislation. Uh, we had to make sure people became aware that this law now exists and people who could use it. Uh, and we had to have initial cases brought successfully to show that the law actually worked. Well, that took a long time, and we really didn't get any significant recoveries until beginning in 1992 and 93. Uh, so that's some six years after the law was enacted. These cases are complicated and they take a long way. But let me quickly explain what the law does as, as signed into law by President Reagan. It empowers, as I mentioned, individuals to initiate a lawsuit on behalf of the government. It makes you a party in federal district court to that case, meaning you have full rights of participation as a party under the federal rules of civil procedure. You're just not someone giving over information, but you're an actual uh, participant. You have a right to object if you think the government's settlement is uh, insufficient based on the facts, and that's, that's very significant. So the government has an opportunity to review your complaint file and make the decision whether to join the case or not join the case. If they decide not to join the case, you have the right to go forward on behalf of the government, representing the government, to pursue that claim, bringing your own private resources to bear uh, to, to further the ends of that case. Uh, and you better have a good case, <clears throat> because if you bring a reckless case, a case not well founded, you could be held uh, liable for significant costs. So there are a lot of incentives and disincentives. It also provides for attorney's fees to be paid by the defendant on an hourly basis uh, to the attorneys who are re representing the client who, who brought the information. That's very important because it creates a financial incentive going forward to continue to pursue the case, knowing that if successful at the end, you'll be fully compensated for your time. Um, and it, um, I'm trying to think if I have all the main elements. I, th I think those are the main elements. Of, there's many more details, but those uh, uh, crucial elements were designed to be what I call action forcing. Uh, it's not just giving over the information to the government and say, here's the information, go forward and let us know how, how it turns out. That doesn't work. It hasn't worked. Uh, if they don't pursue the case, you have the right become the United States uh, Attorney General to pursue the case. And that gives you enormous power. Uh, also, so the two purposes of the law were to bring the information to the service about fraud against the government, and secondly, to bring private resources to bear to pursue those claims, meaning law firms like my law firm. Uh, the, uh, the government doesn't have enough resources to pursue the cases. Uh, and, and the added benefit of giving incentives uh, to bring these cases uh, to lawyers representing clients is absolutely essential and has made a world of difference. Now, it took a long time, as I mentioned, to take root. The first big recoveries began in cases that we brought in 1992. The first one was a $50 million case, you know, a record-breaking case in those days. <clears throat> Another uh, $60 million, $59.5 million case. And by the way, one example there of the role of the right to object. Uh, this is a case I don't think the government would have pursued if we weren't there to pick up uh, and pursue it on their behalf, because that could be very embarrassing if we're successful in a case they turned down. And they asked us, what is the minimum amount you would accept, but without objecting? Uh, to the recover, to the uh, recover before the court, they were prepared to accept 14 million dollars in that case, and I said 60 million dollars. Well, the case settled for 
59 and a half million, just to show that we got a little bit less. But point is, without us being there, uh, the case would have settled for roughly 20, 25%. That's a case shown over and over and over again. The added pressure that we're prepared to pursue it results in substantially greater recoveries and recoveries in cases that the government may not have joined at all. Those are the key elements uh, that have made this case, this whole law tremendously uh, successful. We started out slow in terms of recovery, but remember, one case of $50 million was twice the average of what was recovered by the Justice Department for the entire country in all cases. Uh, but as it built over time, and these cases are complicated and they could take years to complete, by the end of the 1990s, the cases started ramping up and the recovery started going up exponentially. Um, and we, we collectively on our side of the government, uh, the lawyers representing the individuals, we put so much in the way of resources together without which the case wouldn't be brought. For example, there's one huge case. The government was deciding not to take the case because it was too complicated. It's going to take too much in the way of resources. <clears throat> and and it, was, it was a hard case to make. And we understood it to be hard, but we also understood it to be a strong case that should be pursued because there was after actual fraud in the case. So when they were going to, the company announced, we're going to litigate this case, the government came to us and said, look, we can't do it. We need 22 lawyers full time on this case. We can only provide two. And we said, you know, we'll provide the 20 lawyers. We're prepared to do it because we know this case is good. We know our investment of time, even though it's a risk, uh, a re investment of time is worth it. We're going to succeed in the end, and we'll we'll bring all the lawyers that we can. We had 70 lawyers working on that case. It took a total of 10 years. Uh, but the recovery at the end collectively with all the related cases of $1.7 billion that would not have been even brought without this law and the mechanism that this law provides. There are many, many case examples out of one take up a lot of time with specifics, but give you more of a general overview. The recoveries have now gone up to the point where it's about $7 billion a year. You know, it's roughly 300 plus times what it was before. But the big payoff, the big payoff is in the deterrence. Because before this law, if you're dealing with the government, the risks of getting challenged and caught were really low in terms of overcharging, knowingly overcharging them. With this law, the risks have gone up a huge amount, huge amount, 10, 20, 30 times. And the risk of criminal prosecution has gone up once the facts get you get exposed. And here's one, one quick example I just thought of. This is a big, one of the very big, first big cases, 1993 is against a lab that provides blood tests that this lab was uh, figuring out ways of overcharging Medicare by adding medically unnecessary tests that they get paid for on a per test basis. They were making a lot of money doing this at Medicare's expense. Uh, complicated process, I won't get into it, but they knew what they were doing. Medicare was paying for tests they should have been doing. And other labs started seeing their profit going up and they all started doing it. They all started doing it. We, Brought this case. It was a competitor, by the way. Our client was a competitor who saw what another company was doing and knew it was wrong and came to us. And we said, well, this would be a hard case to bring because they're going to say, you know, tests were done, tests were ordered. Uh, where's the fraud? But said, no, they, they developed a scheme to encourage doctors to order medically unnecessary tests. That's the fraud. Anyway, we finally convinced the government to pursue that case. At the end, they paid $100 million, the most they could pay. They should have paid more. The president went to prison. It's a huge case in the field. And that same, that same week was their annual meeting in Washington. All these labs get together. And this was a talk of the convention because everybody there had done the same thing. And a uh, question, I was on this panel with the inspector general. The question was raised, well, Mr. Inspector General, we now, it's a gray area, an area we didn't understand. Well, now you've explained it to us. And if we say we'll change our conduct going forward, will that be good? He said, well, let me put it this way. Say you came in and said, you know, I've been robbing these banks 
around here. And I, I didn't know that was wrong. If I, if I stop robbing the banks, are you going to come after me? for the, What do you think? Well, a hush went up in this hall of you know, maybe 400 people representing 100% of the labs in the country. And out of that very room, <clears throat> over $1.2 billion was collected from those companies who were doing the same thing. But the real payoff was the deterrence because they stopped the practice cold and the money that was being spent by Medicare on labs was going up like this. It leveled off, it went down. So there's the savings over time. Now that's one example of the deterrence, the deterrence effect and the importance of this law. This law has been so efficient because you're not adding to the bureaucracy. This is why President Reagan liked it. This is marketplace incentives. It's privatizing uh, the work of government. It's encouraging every citizen to uh, protect them, and protect the whistleblowers, and come forward because we want and need the information. Uh, you know, that's that's the importance of, of that law, and that's why it worked. And he said, well, let's now expand this to other areas. Why just keep it in areas of fraud against the government? What about fraud in the marketplace? What about failure to pay taxes? What about in this uh, Dodd-Frank, you know, regulatory environment post uh, uh, collapse in 2008. Shouldn't we have similar incentives for people to come forward? Well, they guess what? They did pass not as strong, but similar mechanisms to create incentives for people who know about companies that have engaged in illegal and fraudulent activities, whether on stock trans, trans manipulations, transactions, or whatever. And um, that has now rolling out and showing it to be uh, very effective. It's not as strong an action forcing as the False Claims Act. So the point I want to make is this law has been enormously effective, but listen to this. 85%, I think that's the right number, at least 80 to 85% of all the recoveries that the government now obtains on fraud cases of fraud against the government come from cases initiated by whistleblowers. 15%. 20% come from investigations done by the government, by the Justice Department or agencies of government. Now that says it all. Uh, without this law, we would lose 80 to, uh, 80 to 85% of those recoveries because it's unlikely that any of that would have been recovered. That's the power of this mechanism. And uh, it, it will uh, work, I think, in many systems. I know a lot of the European countries are looking at this. We're going to hear from uh, experts now that we brought together from America that can explain in more detail. I think Tom Devine is the first one to talk about the whistleblower experience and how they're treated, how the government's tried to protect them, what you can and can't do, what's been successful, what hasn't been successful. He's not so much on the False Claims Act, but about the concept of whistleblowing and why that's important in every aspect of government. I know this is kind of a new concept being explored here in Italy, uh, but it's an important one. Uh, in the second panel are two experts, uh, Erica Kelton and Peter Bedetti, both uh, whom I've known uh, well, and Erica was a former law partner of mine. I'm no longer part of my firm because I'm now ambassador. And Peter Bedetti, a doctor, lawyer, is one of the real health experts uh, in the country and in his most a recent job, he was head of all the fraud prevention programs at the federal uh, Medicare uh, program, a huge job, developing whole new systems of how you counter fraud. They know this program inside and out, inside and out. Uh, they know uh, the False Claims Act, the mechanism, and how it works. So you're going to be uh, uh, listening to some real experts about the American system. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be there, uh, but uh, I, I know uh, you'll learn a lot, and I know at the conclusion of this, would like to follow up in any ways we can be uh, of help in, in helping you determine whether this would work uh, for Italy. So uh, have a good conference, and uh, I'll be back to Villa Taberna soon, I hope by the end of the weekend. And uh, I'm also very sorry because tonight we're, we're having a reception for Meryl Streep, one of my favorite actresses, that I won't even get a chance to meet. So uh, a, a 
a double disappointment uh, for me. But it's a great pleasure to have an opportunity to address you directly on how this law came about, how it works, and how it works spectacularly well. And I hope we can, you can find a way to see that it can work in the Italian system too. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. We're, we wish you were here with us as well today, too. We miss you.